I want to kind of go through this history of cereal because it's a passion of mine growing up and it's something that I totally just deleted from my life once I really found out all of the harmful ingredients that are in our cereals. And also st I started to find out some of the stories behind the companies that have made the cereals that have become so popular today. Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. On last week's episode, we really dove deep into the emerging science on how this quarantine has our society more unhealthy than ever. And one of the things we noted was the shocking increases in processed food consumption. For example, General Mills has seen across the board increases in various product lines since this quarantine began. And this got my train of thought thinking about something I've been wanting to do a show topic on for a very long time. It's something that is near and dear to my heart, and that's cereal. All right, I've been wanting to talk about cereal on this podcast for quite some time and really talk about the origins of cereal in the, in the history. And I'm telling you today, it's going to absolutely knock your socks off. All right, this is totally going to blow your mind the advent of cereal and kind of some of the stories of the characters behind the creation of it and the impacts on our health today is, uh, is something that's really, really interesting and really trippy. But for myself personally, it's one of my fondest memories growing up, one of my earliest memories. I was literally three, maybe four years old, and I was hanging out with my great grandmother and she lived in like a senior living facility. And I remember that day getting on to this little special senior citizen bus with her. And I remember feeling like a celebrity as all the older folks are like wanting to shake my hand and they're all smiling at me. I felt so important. And I don't know what it's like to be Tom Cruise, but <laughs> that's probably what is closest. And so I got onto the bus and we took a trip to the grocery store. That was a trip for my great grandmother. And by the way, if you want to picture my great grandmother, so this is, you know, me being multi-ethnic this is my white grandmother and you can picture her she looks like betty white but like with less teeth and like a all-purpose all-day moo moo on all right this little just kind of nightgown thing she wore all the time all right so that's momo all right so we went to the grocery store and she got some stuff and we went back to her place and i sat down she put a bowl in front of me and she poured this cereal that had one of my favorite cartoon characters on the front, Fred Flintstone. And it was a beautiful cereal. She put the milk on there and I started to eat and I was blown away. Not only did I love that cartoon, but I love that cereal. And I can still taste it that moment even today. Have you ever thought about how interesting it is that certain foods, certain flavors take you back to a certain place in time. Certain songs take you back to a place in time, certain smells you know, your olfactory senses. All of our senses are dynamically connected to our memory. It's one of the most powerful things. And from there, in that moment, I became one of the world's most obsessed cereal eating human beings, all right? So from the time of like being three or four up until the time that I met my wife, well then girlfriend, because when I met her, even though I changed so many things in my diet, and I was eating organic and I was eating a lot less processed food, a lot more you know, fruits and vegetables and all this good stuff that I thought I was doing correctly, which many of it was awesome, but I had a thing about cereal. Every night, I would pour a couple of bowls of Honey Nut Cheerios. All right, that was my thing. The B, Busby, me and Busby were tight like that. We were, we were connected, all right, and from there, once I was like, you know, that's enough with this B, all right, Busby, it's been too long. I know that you're not good for me. So I thought I upgraded by getting me some Quaker Oats squares. Like, let me fully adult now, because that's what adulting is, is like eating adult cereals. But it still was a tremendous amount of sugar. And I'm sure that my body was not any happier by making that switch, all right? But eventually, I let the cereal go once I really dove into the science and looking at even consuming that amount of, you know, quote, healthy whole grains wasn't necessarily showing up 
as beneficial to my health. And so today I want to encourage you, before we even get started, to conjure up some of those ideas for yourself. What was your favorite cereal moment? What was your favorite cereals growing up? Saturday morning cartoons and cereal? <laughs> what is better than that? All right, literally, I'm watching Mr. T cartoon eating Mr. T cereal. All right, what an experience. So I encourage you, what are your top five, dead or alive? All right, just like with MCs, top five dead or alive MCs, what's your top five dead or alive cereals from growing up? All right, for me, in no particular order, Apple Jacks. Though there was no apple in there, but definitely got jacked. Uh, Smurf Berry Crunch, another epic moment in my childhood. Sometime around that same three or four year range. I was with my mother when I had the Smurf Berry Crunch. Honey Nut Cheerios, of course, long-term relationship, all right? I'll admit it. Fruit Loops, Toucan Sam had it dialed in. He, had, he was dripping sauce, all right? And then Fruity Pebbles. Momo got me hooked early on. So those are my top five dead or alive. And before we get into the episode, I wanna let you know that right now, I'm doing a giveaway for a $100 Amazon gift card at our YouTube channel. And all you have to do to enter is be subscribed to The Model Health Show on YouTube. And I want you to leave your favorite cereal growing up. You can even leave your top five. What was your favorite breakfast cereal growing up? All right, we'll have a little bit of fun today. Of course, we're gonna talk about the science, but this is all a big part of, for many of us, our DNA, a big part of our experience growing up here in our society. So let's share, let's talk about it. So pop over to our YouTube channel and make sure that you are subscribed and leave a comment and you'll be automatically entered to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Now today we're gonna be talking about some of the most shocking ways that cereal has become a keystone in our culture and the surprising health ramifications that have come as a result of it. But before we do that, I've gotta point out that one of the biggest advertising ploys of cereal manufacturers is their cereals are quote, fortified with vitamins and minerals. Now the problem with this is the same thinking that goes into taking a conventional multivitamin that has, again, synthetic versions of vitamins and minerals and thinking that your body can utilize those better than what you find in real food or even real food concentrates. Now what the latest evidence is finally showing us is that vitamins and minerals are not as readily absorbed and utilized by the body when they're coming in the form of these synthetic multivitamins and fortified foods because they lack the synergistic effects of phytochemicals that are found in real foods and even real food concentrates. And this is according to a 2003 study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. For example, Another study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found that natural food-based vitamin E has roughly twice the bioavailability as synthetic vitamin E. All right, so now we've got it right there in black and white. We know that food-based sources of nutrients are better absorbed by the body. This is one of those things where it just seemed like it was common sense, like it just makes sense, but now we have some data affirming that yes, food is better. Even whole food-based supplements are far better than synthetic versions. And this is why I'm such a big advocate of having a whole food based source of nutrition for our vitamins and minerals, because I mean, truth be told today, it is more difficult. We've all got a lot of stuff going on to get all of the nutrients that we need to really make our body work at its best. Take a plant like Moringa, for example. Moringa is an incredibly nutrient dense food and it's native to Northern India and it's been utilized as food and medicine for thousands of years in cultures spanning from Asia to Africa to the ancient Greeks and Romans as well. Now, listen to this. Gram for gram, Moringa is noted to contain upwards of seven times more vitamin C than oranges, three times more potassium than bananas, four times more calcium than milk, and more iron than spinach, and that's just for starters. It's also a rich source of antioxidants like quercetin, what a cute name, reminds me of Kirsten Dunst. Kirsten, that helps to regulate your blood pressure. But what's amazing is that the absorption of the nutrients that I just listed in Moringa is actually proven. Listen to this, there's another study, and this was published in the Journal of Food Science and Technology, found that taking Moringa leaf powder every day for three months does in fact significantly increase blood antioxidant levels. Amazing, amazing. 
And when I saw that Moringa was one of the ingredients in the Organifi green juice formula, that's when I actually decided to try it out. At that point, I had tried at least like a dozen green food blends. And to be honest, most of them did not taste very good at all. So I wasn't in a rush to try another one. But I saw Moringa was in there. I was like, oh, wait, this is something, this formula is something that I would have done if I was to create a green juice blend myself. I would definitely have Moringa in there. And of course, I was pleasantly surprised that it tasted awesome. And Moringa is just one of the ingredients highlighted in there, along with spirulina, which is an incredible source of antioxidants, chlorophyll, uh, magnesium. It's a great source of magnesium as well. And very rare components like phycocyanin, which is one of those things, rare things in nature that's been found to stimulate the production and mobilization of stem cells in your body. Bananas. All right. Absolutely crazy stuff. So spirulina, chlorella is in there. It's also got ashwagandha, which is clinically proven to help with modulating stress. The list goes on and on. If you don't know by now, Organifi Green Juice is that deal. All right, you've gotta have some. This is where to get your real whole food-based vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, all the things that really makes your body work at its optimum. My kids love it, they have it daily. All right, the green juice formula, red juice formula, the gold as well. Pop over there, check them out. It's Organifi.com forward slash model. You're going to get 20% off every single thing that they carry. So definitely pop over there and check them out. And on that note, let's get to our Apple Podcast Review of the Week. Another five-star review titled, This Show is Amazing by Jesser ACP. I want to personally say thank you to the Model Health Show crew. This show has helped me better understand my body and mind. I'm able to teach my children about health and how important it is on so many levels. Keep up the wonderful work and just know you are an inspiration to many. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for that special acknowledgement for my team as well. You know, I can't do this thing by myself. And we've got my incredible videographer, Connor. So by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, it's thanks to Connor. And also we got Shu on production. His name is Shu. It's not his real name but that's his radio name. He used to work in radio for a long time. Incredible producer. And of course, Ann Stevenson is running everything with the rest of our team. So just a lot of people go into helping to make the magic happen. So thank you for that acknowledgement. And thank you guys so much for making us all a part of your life. We really work diligently to create these shows for you. And today is no exception because be prepared because this is about to blow your mind. Now, let's jump into our topic of the day. And today we're talking about the wild history of cereal and public health. I don't think a lot of people realize that even breakfast in and of itself is a relatively new invention in human history. Prior to around the 14th century, breakfast was something that was, uh, in monistic life, for example, was kind of frowned upon of getting some snacks in before mass, right? And so breakfast was really seen as something that is, is partaken by somebody who is elderly, sick or they're a hard laborer and working under kind of dire circumstances because even still during this time a lot of people kind of did their own thing they grew their own food or engaged in trade things like that but it was really the advent of work hours and employment that you start to see breakfast become more of a commonality now the ideas that we have for breakfast are very different from what they used to be typically around that time, a few hundred years back, would usually consist of maybe some stuff that was left over from the supper the night before, or it often consisted of bread, butter, and some kind of alcohol, all right? Beer or wine. So that's the typical fare that you would see for a breakfast. Now, that isn't to include the noblemen, you know, when breakfast starts to become more in fashion, they would have more elaborate breakfasts that would include things like fish, boiled beef, because you know boiled beef sounds amazing, beer, wine, of course, bread, butter, and even eggs were there in the mix a little bit early on. But now where things get really interesting is at the turn of the 20th century when breakfast itself is revolutionized. Again, prior to this time, it was typical that a breakfast, if people were having it because they were going to do labor all day and they were working from some for somebody else, it would consist of things like what was left over from the night before, eggs, bread and butter, or even hot grain dishes like porridge, all right, porridge. Curds and whey is jumping into my head. All right, little Miss Muffet sat on her top it, tough it. And porridge, of course, three bears, all right? So the stuff in the fairy tales, a lot of people in the U.S., we don't know what those things are, 
all right? But those are basically, it's like a hot cereal with porridge. Now, the first inkling of modern day breakfast cereal was born in 1863, thanks to a physician named James Caleb Jackson. James was also a vocal abolitionist and a religiously conservative vegetarian. And he was the author of such timeless classics as Consumption, How to Prevent It and How to Cure It. And of course, Dancing, Its Evils and Its Benefits. Now, even though these aren't exactly timeless classics, these are real books and I went and actually, <laughs> I couldn't stop reading. So let me read you a passage from his book, Dancing, Its Evils and Its Benefits. So this is directly from his book. He says, quote, with Christian believers, there is a very general distrust existing towards dancing and an amusement. They feel that it is productive of wide evil. And the more liberal of them believe that it is at best productive of only incidental good. Hence, as a general fact, they are arrayed in firm opposition to it and are strongly indisposed to the recognition of the consistent Christian character of him who advocates or partakes of it. Again, talking about dancing. As dancing is conducted generally in this country by those who take part in it, I have no hesitation in saying that the evil far overbalances the good that comes from it, so that it is indefensible and should not be sustained by Christians. Let us look at some of the evils arising from it. Then he goes into different chapters of the book and talking about how evil dancing is. And one of them was a section talking about the environment when you dance. And I'll just read a small portion from it. He says, almost all halls where people congregate for dancing are badly ventilated. And so many persons get poisoned from breathing this air. It's going back to that bad air thing from back in the day that still kind of exists today in our thinking. Another section here, he states that many persons who dance are not habituated to this exercise. They therefore suffer reactions which are violent. All that twitching and twerking. He didn't say that, I did. And to which subsequent sickness of an acute and not infrequently of a dangerous type is to be ascribed. All right, so he's saying People who are not conditioned to dancing, they dance and then they feel bad. Now, I don't know how that actually happens or when. I don't know what kind of dancing he's doing. But reading this and knowing that the person who is the godfather of your favorite cereal was like adamantly against dancing. It reminds me of the movie Footloose. All right. Kevin Bacon had to deal with the same shenanigans. All right. And the guy who really created cereal was against dancing, which is just super weird. It's nothing harmful, but just super weird. Little weird, little fun fact. Dr. Jackson, he ran a medical sanitarium in Western New York. And sanitariums were people who usually were a little bit more wealthy, a little bit better off, would go to these kind of spa places, have all of these strange treatments done. Some of them actually have some sound science to back them up today, like various light treatments, exercise machines, you know, some of them like had vibration uh, equipment along with them and all kinds of uh, nutrition advice and fasting and things like that. But what he did was at his sanitarium, he created a breakfast cereal from graham flour dough and it created this dried block basically. And then they would take it and break it into shapes, but it was so hard, it would literally break your teeth if you tried to eat it, and so they would have to soak it for several hours, generally overnight, in milk often. And this is what he called granola. Granola, not granola, granola, like Dracula, right? Granola, that was the invention, the very first inkling of modern cereal was thanks to Dr. Jackson. Well, one day, another fellow, a, a colleague, of Dr. Jackson named Dr. John Harvey Kellogg dropped in to Dr. Jackson's sanitarium. And Kellogg had his eyes on upgrading the, the conditions at his own sanitarium, right? He was just kind of taking in some of the atmosphere, seeing what he's doing with the nutrition. And he took 
this idea for granola and he basically stole it. All right, he took it back to his place, put together his own formula, very similar from the one he saw, and he called it granola. It wasn't even shy about it. All right, he just swipe or no swiping that one. Now, this is granola is not exactly cereal, the modern cereal that we know. The birth of that modern cereal truly began to take shape when Dr. Kellogg stumbled upon a new recipe with his younger brother. Dr. Kellogg wanted to create a cereal for his patients to improve their mental health, to improve physical health, and to suppress sexual desires. Wait, wait, what? I had to actually go through some of Dr. Kellogg's old fangled writings to see if this was true for myself. And well, here's what I found. Dr. Kellogg was seriously concerned about the health of US citizens, and he believed that the big problem plaguing people's health was rampant sexual desire and masturbation. In his book, Plain Facts for Old and Young, Embracing the Natural History of Hygiene of Organic Life, he listed some of the symptoms of masturbation to be things like poor digestion, mood swings, bad posture, clearly. Also, impaired vision, not so clearly. And paralysis of your lower extremities. He also noted that masturbation could lead to things like bad skin, all the way to things like seizures. Basically everything. It was a list of every symptom you could think of. And it was largely directed towards parents, right? To keep an eye on their kids, right? So, you know, Billy's got poor posture. He must be in there, you know, doing that thing, right? Or, you know, Rebecca's got acne, so she must be double clicking the mouse, you know? And so the thing is, you can't make this stuff up. And I was wondering when I was reading this, like, why doesn't he have a biopic yet? This is crazy. But here's the thing. In Dr. Kellogg's opinion, one of the biggest culprits that was stimulating people's uncontrollable sexual desires was the inclusion of rich, spicy, salty, sweet, and intensely flavorful foods. Food was the culprit, really uh, taking over the minds of our citizens. And he wanted to do something about it. So in his belief, the way to cure it was creating plain, bland foods, bland grains specifically, that can reduce those strong sexual impulses. And with this in mind, he set out to create breakfast foods that would help people to stop these impure desires to start the day, right? That's how you want to start the day, suppress the desire and go out and have a good day. And his golden moment was when he accidentally left out some cooked grains that ended up getting stale. And he, along with his brother, Will, his younger brother, Will, decided to roll the stale grains out and found that they had a nice, crispy, flaky consistency after they were baked in the oven. And he tinkered with the formula a bit and found that corn was the best base. And of course, corn was anti-masturbation approved. And he created the very first ready to eat cereal. Now, if you're wondering how he went from anti-masturbation cereal to Lucky Charms are getting Lucky Charms. If you're wondering how we bridge that gap, well, we have Dr. Kellogg's younger brother, Will, to thank for that. Apparently, Dr. Kellogg was not very kind to his brother, Will, and he had some beef, so he swiped the formula and struck out on his own. And he took the cereal recipe and he added malt, sugar, and salt to the dough and began manufacturing Kellogg's cornflakes in mass quantities. And it was a smash hit right out of the gate. And all of those pro masturbation ingredients, he added really ticked his brother off. And Dr. Kellogg tried to fight him in court, but the company had become so strong and grown so fast in popularity, there was nothing that he can do to stop it. Around the same time, there was another fella who was one of Dr. Kellogg's patients named C.W. Post, as in Post Serial who swiped a recipe idea himself with the granola and created his own version, which was called Grape Nuts, which is neither grape nor nuts. And that became a huge hit as well and started that lineage of cereals and competition going on between Kellogg's 
and Post. So even though Post and Kellogg's have both become household names, most folks don't realize that this all started with a guy trying to create cereal to make everybody's sexual desires get soggy. Fascinating. Now, my question for you and something to ponder was, Dr. Kellogg, was he really onto something by including these grains and these carbohydrate dominant foods? Could this actually help to suppress libido? Or was there an unintended side effect that will happen upon that was actually doing the job that Dr. Kellogg originally wants? Now, if you look at some of the most recent startling evidence, a study published in Clinical Endocrinology, researchers found that sugar, specifically, as added to cereals at this time, induces a significant reduction in total and free testosterone levels. And it also increases something called aromatization. So this is where the testosterone that you're producing gets aromatized or gets kind of stolen in this conversion process and turned into estrogen, all right? So both of those can be things that, uh, these are our glorified sex hormones. They have a lot more to do with just sex than just sex, but this, these are major players, obviously. And sugar, the thing that the younger brother added, was actually doing the job that uh, his older brother actually wanted. So I just want to implant that seed, but I also want to move along this timeline because it was during the 1900s that the younger brother, Will, did something else genius that has still existed until this time today, which was adding a prize into the box of cereal. Genius. It's been over 100 years that this idea was put into place, and it was just, it, it was obviously very effective. And also, we gotta keep in mind that the concept of breakfast and the concept of cereal for breakfast was manufactured by these gentlemen. It had no basis in science, it was just something that was just made up. And in fact, Dr. Kellogg is the person who made this statement that, quote, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It came from that guy, all right? Now, I don't know about you, People can be genius in one thing and, and kind of crazy in another thing, I'm certain. But I would have some reservations in listening to the statements that my man made, you know, simply based on the basis of the things that he was trying to uh, control, the things that he was trying to do. Because also in his practice, uh, the things that were included as treatments was the surgical removal of women's clitoris and also uh, circumcision to remove the foreskin, not for hygienic purposes or whatever the belief is today, but to reduce the 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 rate of the per perceived rate of ma masturbation and pleasure for males. He was implementing these as tactics in, at his in his practice, right? But he wanted cereal to help do the job for him. Crazy! This is a crazy story when we look at the origin of where cereal comes from. But it gets more interesting along the way. There's some fun stuff in here too. So let's jump into the 1910s, all right? Now this is really, really interesting. In the 1910s, explosion puffing technology for rice and wheat was in full effect. The Quaker Oats Company acquired a method of forcing rice grains to explode under pressure and began marketing puffed rice and puffed wheat as a breakthrough in food science. They called them in their marketing the first food, quote, food shot from guns, end quote. How sexy is that? Now, some of these technologies, of course, were in place and utilized and, and bought by consumers for decades, even today, right? We've got the puffed wheat, cereals, puffed rice. You might think of cereals like uh, Honey Smacks and Golden Crisp and just various versions of puffed rice but uh, it became a very pervasive food item in our culture. And so that was jumping in the 1910s. Now, if we jump to the 1920s, specifically, a health clinician in Minnesota was simmering wheat gruel, because that's what you do then, was simmering some wheat gruel for intestinally distressed patients and accidentally spilled the gruel onto a hot stove and watched it dry into wheat flakes. This was the birth of Washburn's 
gold medal whole wheat flakes, soon to become known as Wheaties. Now, Wheaties was the first cereal to create a truly iconic marriage between sports and product. In the 1930s, Wheaties was able to get testimonials from sports heroes like Luke Gehrig and 45 of the other 51 players on the 1939 Major League All-Star team. And it turned this modest little wheat flake cereal into something of legend. If you wanted to play like the professionals, if you wanted to truly eat like your heroes, this is a cereal for you. This cereal became the quote, breakfast of champions. And in the decades that followed, one legendary athlete after another appeared on the box, the orange box, Names like Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Dan Marino, Mary Lou Retton, Tiger Woods, Michael Phelps, the list goes on and on. Getting on the Wheaties box is a status symbol, even for the athletes. And this was thanks to a happy accident for making wheat gruel. So now we're gonna jump to the 1930s. And this is where the Ralston Purina Company introduced an early version of wheat checks calling it Shredded Ralston. That's a pretty crummy name. And by the way, Ralston Purina, I think of dog food. That's what they're really notable for, is for food for pets. But Shredded Ralston hit the scene. Now this cereal was intended to feed the followers of Ralstonism, and Ralstonism was created by a man named Webster Eggerly. And followers of his movement, and by the way, it was almost a million followers, it was noted to be 800,000 followers, followed the motto Ralston, which was an, an acronym, and it stood for Regime, Activity, Light, Strength, Temperation, Oxygen, and Nature. All right? And these first letters spelled out Ralston. Now, Ralstonism required its adherents to follow a very strict guideline of diet and personal hygiene. And its founder, Eggerly, wrote books to promote his beliefs on how to achieve longevity, how to be sexually magnetic, and how to develop telepathy. Because that's a thing. Because clearly being sexually magnetic isn't enough. You need to be able to read people's minds if you really want to have that sauce. All right, so... That was one of the other things that they believed in. But Eggerly also advocated the castration of all non-Caucasian males at birth. So it suffice to say that he was pretty racist. And Eggerly saw his followers as the founding members of a new superior white race that would be free from, quote, impurities. And again, as weird as it might sound, these are the origins of cereal in our country. And Chex is one of the cereals that kind of came out of the Ralston movement. And for me, I attribute Chex to like happiness because of the commercials. I, I love, love double, double Chex, Chex better, better than, than the, the rest, rest, corn, corn, rice, rice, sweet, sweet, crunch, crunch, double. Right? I, I love, love double, double Chex, Chex better, better than, than the, the rest, rest. Shout out to those who know that song uh, growing up. But just another interesting angle on how this was created. There is often a seed of trying to provide uh, a mental and physical superiority through the cereal. But over time, that got to be mutated into something else. And I think that that can be tied to some of the original intentions behind the people in the companies putting this stuff together because, man, energy never, uh, never gets destroyed, but it definitely changes forms and gets transmuted. So if we jump to the 1940s, this is when we see the continued rise of breakfast cereal, thanks in part to physicist Lester Borchard, who was working for General Mills in Minnesota. He and his team developed a puffing gun that puffed oats into small O shapes, little O's. The new cereal was called Cherry Oats, and the name was quickly changed to Cheerio. So this was coming out in the 1940s, but the name was changed because of a beef from Quaker Oats. So they had like a East Coast, West Coast beefs based on cereal, I guess. And Quaker Oats was like, you can't have oats in your name. It's, it's too much ours, that's our thing. And they threw up their little 
you know, Quaker gang signs and made them change it. So it became Cheerios. Now, this is still one of the top selling cereals today. Cheerios has become famous, or should I say infamous, for being a healthy cereal option. And in recent years, Cheerios has been able to make really outlandish marketing claims, usually through marketing characters like this. Hey, kid, what you got there? Gee, Susie, it's the greatest thing. Cheerios helps lower cholesterol as part of a heart-healthy diet. You know, for grown-ups. Now, in this commercial, they put it in teeny tiny letters that, quote, studies show that three grams of soluble fiber daily from whole grain oat foods, like Cheerios, in a diet low in saturated fat and cholesterol may reduce the risk of heart disease. Cheerios cereal provides one gram per serving. End quote. What an incredible marketing ploy to say that Cheerios is part of a heart healthy diet. Cheerios can reduce your cholesterol. I got to give it to them. You know, they, they put it out there, but this was largely allowed and they've only pivoted recently. It was in 2009 the FDA took issue with the claim on Cheerios boxes that Cheerios can lower bad cholesterol. And in the letter, the FDA told General Mills that either it needed to change the print on Cheerios boxes or apply to get Cheerios classified as a cholesterol lowering drug. Now there's two parts to this. One part is the FDA is saying, hey, your cereal is improving to do that. The other part is saying, the only thing that can lower your cholesterol is a drug. So who's right here? Anyways, um, so moving on. If you're wondering, also, for me, when I hear Cheerios, I think of the other versions of Cheerios. Apple Cinnamon Cheerios, for example. So if you're wondering about the different varieties when they came out, the first one was actually 1976, and it was Cinnamon Nut Cheerios that came to the market first, which was quickly discontinued because people didn't like it. But then General Mills struck cereal gold with the release of Honey Nut Cheerios three years later. And Honey Nut Cheerios were instantly popular and became the number one cereal in America, eventually leading up even until recent years. And, and another note, by the way, the plain Cheerios, and I don't know about you, but as a kid and other kids, even back in the 1940s, they would take these cereals that were kind of more for adults. And they would add sugar to it to make it more palatable for kids. And we would get these you know, we would get food sometimes from food banks and on the WIC program where we had specific cereal that we can get and they lar largely didn't have the sugar that we were accustomed to. So my brother and sister and I, we would add sugar to the cereal. You know, we get the Cheerios or the Toastios because we get the generic kind and add sugar to it. And we would honestly put so much sugar that at the end of the cereal, it's like white, wet sand at the bottom of the bowl. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but this is something that we used to do and kids were doing it back then. And the cereal marketers noticed this and they began adding more sugar to their products and shifting their focus on marketing more towards the kids who love their cereal as well and they wanted more sugar. But before we get into the sugary sweet times of today's cereal, let's take a look at when the generational shift actually took place. So we're gonna take our time traveling DeLorean to the 1950s where sugar began to truly take center stage in breakfast cereals. This is when cereals like Kellogg's Frosted Flakes hit the scene, along with its pitch man, Tony the Tiger. And this was also when we saw a new era of television advertising and marketing to kids. They would have whole mini episodes of cartoons just surrounding the selling of a cereal. Can you imagine? Number one, cartoons are a super new thing. Kids are obsessed with them. And marketing to children put together in one, it was like a no-win situation. For example, Alphabet cereal, Alphabet cereal had Mighty Mouse as one of their featured characters. And this is one of the statements that Mighty Mouse would make. Yes, sir, because they are good for you made of crisp oats to help build strong bodies, sparkled with just the right amount of sugar for quick extra energy. So your good buddy Mighty Mouse is telling you that sugar is going to give you quick extra energy. What are you gonna do? You're gonna power up on that cereal, right? Not only can you spell out words in your bowl with the alphabets, but you can also get energy to be strong like Mighty Mouse and save the day. 
So that's when we really saw it take place was during the 1950s. And if we take a time jump to the 60s and 70s, this is where we see the explosion of colorful, fruity flavored cereals with the popularized use of artificial flavors and colors in cereals. Now there was a device called a gas chromatograph that was able to isolate flavors in various foods that have been used for quite some time where you can isolate flavor notes of a strawberry and then take that flavor and add it to something else, right? To create a strawberry flavored soda or strawberry flavored yogurt or whatever the case might be. No strawberries required, right? But humans evolved having connections, neurological, biological connections to flavors. Flavors indicated certain nutrients are coming alongside those things. But now we're getting the flavors, we're getting hijacked in flavor, but we're not getting the nutrients along with those flavors. And it starts to create chaos in our minds and we don't even realize it. And so this is when the, this technology was starting to really be used at its ultimate potential for cereal. Now, in addition to the artificial flavors and the sugar, we also had the widespread use of artificial food colorings that have raised serious concerns for decades now that is only getting some serious attention in the media right now. So going back and looking at one of my childhood favorites that I talked about already, Fruity Pebbles, in addition to the absurd amount of sugar that it contains, it also contains Red 40, Yellow 5, Yellow 6, Blue 1, and Blue 2. Just think about making a recipe, like you're cooking with your kids, and you're like, can you hand me the blue? What is that? So weird, right? But now here's the thing. According to a study published in Environmental Health Perspectives, Red 40, Yellow 5, and Yellow 6 contain a well-noted human carcinogen that's, of course, permitted at low, presumably safe levels in food dyes. On the safety issues that this could be having for our children, shouldn't this be removed from the products until we can clear this particular ingredient. Shouldn't we get it cleared first before we have it in our food supply? It's sort of like assuming that any man-made chemical-laden substance is innocent. It's acceptable for use until proven otherwise. And it really should be the opposite. Because if we dig a little bit deeper, we have evidence like this. A randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover trial tested whether intake of artificial food colorings affected childhood behavior. This study published in The Lancet demonstrated that there's clear evidence that artificial colors and conventional preservatives in our kids' diets result in hyperactivity. Specifically, it took groups of three-year-olds and groups of eight and nine-year-olds. And again, we have data like this, shouldn't these things be removed? And in Europe, the European Union started to require food labels to indicate that a product contains any of these potentially harmful food colorings. And Bernard Weiss, professor emeritus of the Department of Environmental Medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center, who has researched this issue for decades, says that he is frustrated that the FDA has not acted on the research showing the connection between artificial dyes and hyperactivity. Again, kid cereals and hyperactivity. He said, quote, all the evidence we have has shown that it has some capacity to harm. In Europe, that's enough to get it banned because a manufacturer has to show a lack of toxic effects. In this country, it's up to the government to find out whether or not there are harmful effects, end quote. Now, researchers at Purdue University published a study uncovering that cereal is in the top three highest sources of artificial food dyes in children's diets. The report estimated that a child could easily consume 100 milligrams of food dyes per day, easy and that some children are consuming 200 milligrams of food dyes per day. This is bigger than the issue with sugar. Just understanding that this kind of decent intention in the beginning to add health to people's lives has evolved into something other than over the years. And I've definitely been a part of it, and I know that many of you have as well. And this is about, again, getting educated on what's really kind of going on with this entity and also so what are some of the things that we can do about it because there are some really really cool things happening that, will, that I'll tell you about in a moment. Now this was also a time during the 60s and 70s if we jump to 1977 some of the other favorites like Cookie Crisp 
were released. Now, before the cereal companies were kind of being a little bit like, this isn't, this isn't bad for you. It's part of a complete breakfast. Then all of a sudden they were like, forget it. We're just going to make a bowl of cookies, right? Like, how do we get to that place? And if you just think about the scenario, we've got a mother and her son having a conversation in the morning. Maybe the son is eight years old. He's getting ready for school. He's like, hey, mom, can I have some cookies today for breakfast? And she looks at him crazy. Absolutely not. That is not healthy for you to have for breakfast. But then little eight-year-old Timmy says, but you let me eat cookie crisp cereal. In the words of DJ Khaled. Congratulations, you played yourself. It's still cookies. It's the same ingredients. It's just in this quote cereal form and then it becomes acceptable. Now, if we look at the ingredients of cookie crisp as they stand today, it's number one, whole grain corn, which breaks down into sugar. Sugar, which is sugar. Cornmeal, which breaks down to sugar. Yellow corn flour, sugar, starch. Canola oil, yay. Corn syrup, yeah, you already know. Cocoa processed with alkali. Then we've got brown sugar syrup. Mm -hmm. Salt, caramel coloring, baking soda, natural flavor. It's a lot of starch and sugar. And we've allowed this to become culturally acceptable. Now, not to say that we can't have our cookie crisp. If this has a connection to you, but there might be some even better options that bring uh, an equal amount of joy as well. And again, we'll get to that in a moment. But, but speaking of sugar and breakfast cereal specifically, I really don't think that we realize just how much sugar we're downing to start the day. This was my everyday thing. Even when I was going to school and getting the free lunch, oftentimes we get these little personal sized bowls of cereal. It's got like a little uh, tear away lid on it and you pour your, your milk into that bowl. For me, oftentimes I got Frosted Flakes because that was one of my favorite things that was available or my Fruit Loops. Now, when you hear that a parent is giving their kid a Coca-Cola for breakfast, that would sound pretty ridiculous. It's like, that's so much sugar, right? Well, a regular 12 ounce serving, which is one and a half cups of Coca-Cola, is about 39 grams of sugar. While one and a half cups of one of Kellogg's most popular cereals, Honey Smacks, is 30 grams of sugar. Add on a serving of 2% milk over top and you've got over 40 grams of sugar before heading off to school. It's more than a 12 ounce Coca-Cola. But hey, I mean, can we even really get upset at that? They put smacks in the name of the cereal. It's been smacking around our metabolism for decades. But now we're hoping to bring some light to the subject and helping to identify these cereals for what they really are. Cereal killers. If we jump to the 80s, this is largely considered the golden age of cereal and when co-branding was the name of the game. Gremlin cereal, Donkey Kong cereal, Mr. T cereal, WWF Superstar cereal, Ghostbusters cereal, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cereal, and my personal favorite, Smurf Berry Crunch. What the Smurf are you Smurfing? Right? That's how they talk. You know, they put Smurf into place of different words, but you still know what they're saying. So what the Smurf is up? Now, marketing right now and looking at all this cold branding was still largely targeted towards kids in a major way. And the FTC supposedly started cracking down around this time on cereal companies who were spending the majority of their marketing dollars on advertising to kids. According to one of the latest reports from the Federal Trade Commission, the makers of breakfast cereals, fast food, and carbonated beverages, all major sources of added sugars in the American diet, had the majority of their marketing budgets go towards marketing to children. And it was at approximately 72% of their dollars. And we're talking billions. We're talking billions of dollars going into these marketing efforts to kids. The concept of cradle to the grave branding really came into its own in the 1980s and 90s. And this is when folks like James McNeil, the author of the book, Kids as Consumers, a handbook of marketing to children, reported that, quote, the only way to increase customers is to switch them from other brands or grow them from birth. And in our society, it is actually easier to grow customers from birth than to switch them. End quote. 
Another study conducted by researchers at UCLA determined that watching commercial television as opposed to DVDs or educational programming directly correlated to higher body mass index in children. This, the researcher said, was due to the fact that children see, on average, 4,000 television commercials for food by the time that they're five years old. Do we even stand a chance? But funny enough, it's not just the marketing that we see on television. It's also in the store, too. There's a study conducted by researchers at Yale and Cornell University that established that cereal mascots like Captain Crunch, who make eye contact with purchasers, encourage more feelings of trust and connection with their product and led to 28% more brand loyalty. I know you've seen Captain Crunch giving you the googly eyes. Now, first of all, He's cap in, cap in. He's not a captain, all right? He didn't actually go through any kind of rigorous training. He didn't get any kind of certification. So can he actually, and he's got a uniform on, so you think he's official. But seriously though, Captain Crunch Berries is absolutely delicious. I'm not gonna knock that. But there's a bigger thing at play here. It's just to get you cradled to the grave, get you hooked, keep you buying, even if it's hurting you. That's the problem because I have no issue if something is bringing you vitality and joy, even if it's bringing you joy and it's not the best and you occasionally do it, so be it. But these things become so pervasive and addictive and we went through on so many different levels how they've really got ingrained and I can still, I could taste Apple Jacks right now, is Right now, we're looking at a situation where the, the conversation is finally beginning to change because it was in the 2000s that we saw a big shift towards, quote, health conscious cereals. Now, with that said, these were still largely touting the belief that healthy whole grain cereals that were loaded with carbohydrates to start the day were ideal, but we're just removing some of the sugar, having organic grains, and these would be the ideal choice for health conscious consumers. Now, with that said, there are levels to this. Of course, avoiding inflammatory ingredients, artificial dyes and flavors, and uh, switching over to things that aren't loaded with sugar. These are steps in the right direction, but we still have to keep into account, it might not be a good idea to start our day by carb loading. And this is highlighted in a study conducted by researchers at St. Louis University. And this was published in the International Journal of Obesity. And it sought to discover what happens with fat loss when you eat a high carbohydrate breakfast versus a high protein, high fat breakfast with the calorie count of the meals being the exact same. The researchers had the study participants decrease their overall caloric intake by 1000 calories in the study but they had different people on these different macronutrient ratios for their first meal of the day. Only, this was the only difference, was a high carb breakfast or a high protein, high fat breakfast. Here's what they found after an eight week study period. The study participants in the lower carb breakfast group showed a 61% greater reduction in body mass index and a 65% greater weight loss and a 34% greater reduction in waist circumference and a 16% greater reduction in overall body fat. This just trips me out. It's just like, and, and so many things improved simply by shifting that macronutrient ratio of that first meal. So even though we made a big shift with these more health conscious cereals, we can still take it a step further. And for me, this really clicked in my mind when we were doing an episode when I had on Ori Hoffmeckler. And he's a best-selling author, and he's been in this field for decades. And he's the person who really kind of pushed into popular culture concepts of like intermittent fasting and um, having the ability to have nutrient stressors, right? Certain nutrients that provide a healthy amount of stress to the body. And one of the things that he mentioned was the fact that at some point, somebody's going to create cereals that are low to no carbohydrates or low to no sugar and high in protein and maybe even out of something like whey protein 
And I was like, that's interesting. I wonder if that'll ever happen. And it did. It actually happened because, because I found out about this incredible cereal company that was dedicated towards doing stuff, not just making progressive steps, but like, let's do this the best way possible and address more of the issues that people have with conventional cereals. But here's the thing. I'm sorry, but Kashi is not delicious. All right. That's when I was trying to get healthy. I was eating the cereals like I'm just eating like twigs and berries, you know, like I'm eating. I don't know. Um, I, I was eating some some sarsaparilla or something. It's just like it was not a pleasurable experience eating my kashi. If I want to have a bowl of cereal, like even if it's just for like a little fun snack from time to time, give me some of that nostalgia. Give me some of that good feeling. Give me some of that those flavor sensations. But do this in a way that's not going to gum up my metabolism. And here's what this cereal has come up with. It's high in protein. It's 11 grams of protein per serving, made from a high quality combination of whey protein. So I was just like, well, what about the flour that you would, type, that you would use? And like, sometimes you can't get the consistency right using various types of flours, but they did it without even needing to include flours. Zero sugar. It's actually zero sugar, sweetened with natural sweeteners like monk fruit and stevia, and it only has three grams of net carbs per serving. And they've got flavors like blueberry birthday cake, frosted, cocoa, that's my wife's favorite. My favorite is the fruity. Keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, GMO-free, no artificial ingredients. It has, I opened the, the fruity is my favorite. I opened the bag, the aroma, if you can see me on YouTube, the aroma was really what did it for me and that connection to like, oh, that's cereal right there. You know, but again, this is something that I'm just going and hammering cereal all the time, but we can do this better. And I want to make sure that we're getting products out to the public and starting to change the culture, starting to shift the buying behavior and moving ourselves away from all of the, the sugar that is, clinically proven to cause all these problems and also add in things that we need like protein as well that can help with satiety and moving away from the artificial food dyes that we know again can cause problems with hyperactivity just to name one and also being a carcinogen. I think it's an amazing, amazing product and I highly recommend you get yourself some. I connected, we proactively actually reached out to them because I wanted to see if I can get some kind of special offer for you to try it out as well. Because if you got a, a hunkering or hankering for some cereal, I want you to have some good stuff on hand. And so if you go to magicspoon.com forward slash model, that's magicspoon.com forward slash model, you can grab yourself a variety pack if you want and try all the different flavors, or you can just get the one that you want to zero in on. And use the code model, M-O-D-E-L, at checkout, and you'll get free shipping. And right now, Magic Spoon is absolutely taking off. So many of my colleagues in this space are utilizing Magic Spoon and just recommend it, recommending it for people because we know how pervasive cereal eating is in our culture and just trying to do this a little bit better. Now, again, we're taking steps there in the right direction. And because it is so uh, energy intensive for Magic Spoon to create a high quality cereal like this, can only get them right now in these uh, value packs. So make sure to get yours, try it out. And just so you have a box on hand whenever you wanna have some cereal and it's really just a whey protein. And you also get free shipping. So that's what we were able to get access to for you guys. And so keep in mind, the basis of your diet should be whole real foods. But if you want a tasty treat with the nostalgia of eating delicious cereal, you need to try Magic Spoon. And Magic Spoon is so confident in the product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. If for any reason you don't like it, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. I want to kind of go through this history of cereal because it's a passion of mine growing up and it's something that I totally just uh, deleted from my life once I really found out all of the harmful ingredients that are in our cereals. And also st I started to find out some of the stories behind the companies that have made the cereals that have become so popular today. You know, if you look at uh, Dr. Harvey Kellogg, you know, you go into his spa for a nice spa day and you end up getting your 
genitalia burned off. You know, like it's just that shouldn't happen. You know what I mean? But again, with the diet portion, he was trying to find a way from what he believed to get people healthier. You know, we've come so far since that time, but we still have a long way to go, you know, and we can take advantage of the wonderful things that we have coming up along the way. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, this is all a learning experience for all of us. And there's no shame at all in being somebody who's a big fan of cereal. You know, this is the Model Health Show, and we really focus on nutrition at the highest levels. But everything is an option. Everything is an option. And all of us have a story. And my story, if I could pick a food that has been the most, the thing that jumps out the most in my growth and in my years, it would be cereal. I've got memories tied to those things, right? So after school, cartoons were great. All right, we had Transformers. Thundercats, the Saturday morning cat cartoons. Grandma watching, you know, The Equalizer and Magnum P.I. during the, the, the school days. Sorry, Grandma, Saturday mornings are for kids. And this was a time, can you imagine, this was a time when cartoons were not available 24-7. You got like a couple hours Saturday morning, it's prime time for kids. Muppet Babies, Ninja Turtles, Ghostbusters, all that stuff. And having a bowl of cereal in that experience really was, I, I looked forward to it. I really love those experiences. But what's up with on Saturday morning after the cartoons go off? It's just the weirdest programming comes on after that. It was like basket weaving convention or something, you know, it's super weird stuff. But these are all part of our experiences. And I'm grateful for you making me a part of your experience. And I hope that you learned a lot today and some little fun facts that you could share with other people. And of course, again, pop over to the YouTube channel and leave a comment to enter yourself into the giveaway for the $100 Amazon gift card. All right, so make sure you're subscribed to the Model Health Show on YouTube, leave a comment, and you'll be automatically entered. We've got some epic, epic new shows coming your way very soon. And just please keep in mind that as things start to shift with this quarantine, that we need to be even more adamant about protecting our health, about investing in our health, our physical movement, nutrition, getting high quality sleep. And so as we're moving towards change right now, we have to keep in mind that we're going to see a new normal. And you want to start to shift your habits right now towards getting yourself prepared for when things open up and you know you kind of get back to a day-to-day -day routine. The time is now, so let's not wait. All right. And I appreciate you so much for tuning into the show today. And once again, pop over to YouTube, leave a comment, make sure you're subscribed for some good stuff. We got so many cool things coming on YouTube as well. I appreciate you so much for tuning in. Take care, have an amazing day, and I'll talk with you soon. So if you're sitting in your meditation and your brain is going, you can't quit, it's too hard, you're becoming familiar with those thoughts, that's a meditation. There's no such thing as a bad meditation. There's just overcoming yourself. You're sitting there and your body wants to get up and do things and check your email and check your texts and you become aware that it's doing that, and you become familiar with that, you're in a meditation.